Hello and welcome to our viewers on cruxambassador.com and also to our listeners on Cruxcast, our podcast series. And for those of you who are new to Crux Investor, please click the button below to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're talking today to Paul Begin, he's the CFO of Continental Gold. He's going to be talking to us about terrorism, pouring gold, share price and money. And if you want to see where those appear in the video, look for the timestamps in the description below. So Paul, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Where are you speaking from? I'm speaking out of the uh, head office in Toronto. Okay, great, great, great. Well, like, um, I think uh, Ari, Ari was going to be with us. He's, uh, he's uh, dealing with some other issues at the moment. So thanks very much for taking the, the time out to speak with us today. Um, I usually get people to kick off with a two-minute summary of the business, and then we get stuck into some questions. Okay, great. Uh, well, first of all, thanks. For, uh, I'm happy to sub in. Um, you know, Continental Gold is a is a Colombian-based company, gold mining company, and we focus on high-grade assets. And um, we're focusing on building our flagship asset called Buritica or Buritica, uh, which is located about a two-hour drive from Medellin. Um, it's a high-grade, multi-million ounce deposit that's uh, on the verge of of, of uh, nearing commercial production. Um, so we're going to go through a lot of topics here, but I think the, the first things first, I want to get this out of the way. You, you had a bit of an incident. Uh, I think you're classifying it as terrorism, but you know there, there's some issues locally. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and what you know what's what you're doing about it? Yeah, yeah. So we had uh, we had two secure, obviously very severe and, and uh, serious security incidents in September of last year. One happened uh, just outside of Beritica. Um, and that, that which resulted in one fatality. The other serious security incident happened uh, like in our Berlin project, which is an exploration project that we have, which is pretty far away from Beritica. Um, and, and unfortunately that resulted in, in three fatalities. So um, I think it's fair to say that when we look back at 2018, uh, we accomplished uh, you know, the majority of our objectives, but if you're gonna have you know, one kind of wish you can redo uh, is really if we took a different perspective on our security situation. Um, don't know if we could have done something differently. You never know with these things, right? Uh, hindsight's always 20, 20. Uh, but since then we've, we've undertaken a massive revamp of our security department uh, from the bottom up. Uh, we brought in experts, we've changed the personnel, uh, we've changed the protocols, and uh, we're trying to work, uh, yeah, obviously, in more conjunction with the military and police to make sure that these never happen again. And uh, you know, to this day, there's still a sad feeling in, amongst our employees and consultants that we lost three call or four colleagues uh, in these incidents. But you know, this is—I don't want to say part of growing up, but you know, it was certainly a, an eye opener for us. I know you're working with the local police, army, etc., to deal with this, but. You, have you got some sort of sense of you know what what was the cause of it, uh, whether there's more unrest or uh, resentment in in the community or? Yeah, um, in in the first security incident, um, you know it, it it was clearly retribution for closing down for the government closing down an illegal mine, right? That's pretty clear. Uh, in the other security incident in Berlin, um, you know there's a lot of different theories. In my in my view, we were just really at the wrong place at the wrong time. And, uh, you know, we were told by, you know, the military, we were told by the mayor, we were told by the priest that it was, we were welcome there. And we went in there and, uh, and lo and behold, uh, we weren't. So uh, again, that led us to kind of do a very inward looking uh, kind of exercise to kind of try to understand how we could have missed you know, missed the, any sign that possibly could have prevented that. Um, but, you know, as of for now, you know, we're not going, we're, we're just focusing on building Beritica. We're not going into uh, Berlin anytime soon. And, uh, you know, we're going to get this into commercial production. And then we will look, once it's into commercial production, that started to expand our footprint from an exploration perspective. But there is so much exploration upside just within the Beritica project that, you know, we have, there's a ton of opportunity there 
and obviously Beritica is safe. Uh, and, and, you know, so we could just focus, focus there for now. Right. So, and I guess the, the hope there is that once people sort of see you operating there for some time and they get used to you being there and I guess the, well, I guess the money starts flowing as it were in, into the area and the benefits are seen that you'll be accepted and perhaps mitigate some of this risk of this happening again. Is that the hope? Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, but you know, one thing's for sure, if you go back far enough in our history, um, you can, you'll realize that back, I think it was in 2013, you know, we had an, an illegal mining invasion mm -hmm. and the government did a, did a great job, a tremendous job, you know, uh, in removing these illegal miners, uh, you know, according to, to world-class international standards, I'm mm -hmm. talking about, you know, you know, they did it safely. They did it, uh, socially responsibly. You know, quite frankly, kudos to them because, you know, and there are many people that want to do case studies on this, on kind of how you remove kind of these mass migration of people. Mm. Uh, so since then, uh, you know, the community and Continental have forged a very strong partnership. So, um, and we'll continue to work on that. We don't take anything for granted, but there is a very strong understanding and appreciation and good working relationship between the community and CNL what we need to be mindful of is that there's the only loser on putting a formalized mine into Beritica mm. is illegal mining yeah. and illegal mining is backed by, you know, not so great people. So we can't let our guard down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, like, thank, thanks for dealing that. And obviously our, our thoughts and commiserations to the families uh, that, that lost uh, loved ones. Um, right. So let's get into the project. Um, you've, got a huge project the, the numbers look great and we'll get into those in a second but you've also got some great partners you got some pretty big names in there do you want to sort of tell everyone about yeah. who, who's involved yeah of course we have three very strong and supportive partners first and foremost for, foremost is newmont mining newmont mm -hmm. initially came in in 2017 when they paid 109 million us for 19.9 percent .9 equity stake in continental mm -hmm. uh, uh, Newmont's been a great partner. Um, I like to say they got the greatest toolbox, mining toolbox in the world uh, that has been at our disposal since their investment in 2017. And they've been a big help in pressure testing various technical issues to make sure that, you know, we're going down the right path. Okay. okay? okay. Um, they topped up their investment. Uh, they participated. And I would like to, I'd call them the anchor investment. Uh, in, an, in the deal that we announced in March of 2019, where they took 50 million of a $175 million deal, uh, which was in the form of a convertible. Okay. 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 The next partner we have is Red Kite Mine Finance, which is our senior secure debt lender. Um, they've provided $275 million debt principal uh, to us. Um, they've been a great partner to work with. They're flexible. Um, uh, you know, they kind of think a little bit a little out of the box. Uh, what we loved about Red Kite was, you know, we got flexible terms, very, very covenant light, but most importantly, um, they were very quick to fund us. So if you go back again in, in our history, you know, we received our environmental in 2016, late 2016, and it was, every, and it was in everybody's interest that we get started on building the Beritica project as soon as possible. Uh, and we were able to close the Red Kite mine finance uh, secure debt so early January 2017 and we had access to the funds immediately so that uh, it allowed us to get going immediately and get local people to work and and start the healing process of the kind of the removal of these illegal miners right and then you got triple flag in there as well yeah that's right and last but not least is triple flag who we uh, we secured a hundred million dollar stream just recently in March of 2019 in exchange for 2.1% gold stream and 100% of our silver stream with a full buyback on the on the gold portion of the gold uh, of the stream for which is available to us up to December 31st 2021 for 80 million dollars less any amounts that have been uh, funded on the gold portion of that stream yep. we're happy with that yes yeah, I was say you know that, that, that sounds Quite nice terms. Um, and given you're the CFO, you're, you're, you're the guy I need to be speaking to. So tell me a little bit about the convert and the terms around that. 
Okay, it's a it's a pretty much a, a vanilla type of convert. It's uh, it's it carries a coupon at five percent. It's the term is just over five years. Um, the convertible price is three dollars Canadian, which which was approximately I want to say a roughly a thirty three percent premium at around the time that we did it. Mm. I can't remember. Don't quote me on the exact number, but give or take. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much uh, a vanilla type of convert. One thing we did get that that wasn't wasn't customary was we got a no hedge policy right uh so and, and i mean that's not important to newmont and i don't think newmont would would go ahead and and short the stock anyway but uh but they were they were agreeable to those kinds of that term and we think that's important from a convertible perspective uh for sure i mean so why why go with the con i'm assuming there's some kind of holiday period because you're not producing cash at the moment so was there was that in there again trying to minimize dilution uh, right, and uh, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, that was a that was another way of us getting a premium, uh, you know, from an equity perspective. Um, you know, with when Newmont initially came in, they paid a roughly, I want to say again, forty percent premium to the to the market rate when they came in on their initial investment. That has obviously shares had come down since then, and we were just trying to find a way that would, would you know, work together with the stream. And Red Kite as being the secured lender, and 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 the convert is an is was a, a unique way of putting an unsecured piece to the puzzle. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them work, and I've seen them struggle. Um, so tell me yeah, about. Yeah, I think and I think the important the, the big reason why they do struggle a lot is because they just they fly out the door and they go to hedge funds and then they short the stock. <laughs> yeah, right. That doesn't help. That doesn't help. Um, yeah. and it's it's a pretty big number. I mean. I guess what strikes me about the company, you've been able to attract Newmont, which is which is great. That's got to help in terms of valuation. They, obviously, they, they don't walk into any old thing, right? And you've got some scale in terms of ounces in the ground, and you're showing quite an impressive ASIC number. That 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 you know that that looks great. Um, and the forecast for you know was it 235 ounces a year? Give or take. Actually, the life, life of mine in the study is just over 250, 250,000, just over. 250, okay, great. And that's... Right. That's life of mine. And I think the first five, three or five years of production is closer to 300,000. Right, okay, fantastic. Sorry, obviously looking at the wrong data. Um, so, so, I mean, you, you got a lot going on, on there. And um, tell me a bit more about how do you manage the Newmont relationship? I mean, what are their expectations of the business, of the relationship, and how do you manage that relationship? Okay, so uh, uh, when they came in on the initial investment, we agreed to set up three non-binding management committees. One was on the social side of things, one was on the technical side of things, and one was on the exploration side of things. Um, and so th those were established immediately after their initial investment in 2017. They meet quarterly. Right. And, uh, and, and it's been great. I mean, there's been a sharing of ideas, um, you know, uh, whatever it is, whether it's the, you know, whether it's the mine plan or whether it's the resource estimate or whether there's, you know, there was some concern on a tech, technical aspect of our circuit. Um, you know, all of these things have been kind of worked on with, in conjunction one, with one another. And glad to say that there hasn't been any type of showstopper, but it's certainly comforting from where we sit and here in Toronto that you know, there's been some eyes on 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 the project at various angles. Yeah, I mean that must be great, as you say, one of the largest toolboxes in the business. But at the same time, money's a funny thing, right? And by that I mean, you know, there's going to be a point where it's it's more in their interest than your interest, or or vice vice versa. You know, how do you? What's your expectation of where this project is going with them? At what point do they say, hey, you guys need to step out of the way? We're coming in here, or are they going to sit and let sit and have a kind of free ride? Well, not free ride; they, they paid money, but you know what I mean. How does how does it work from that perspective? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, we have a standstill with Newmont until mid of mid of twenty twenty, right? Okay. Which is really, I mean, that was negotiated again with the initial investment, and the, the timing there was kind of just get let's get it to commercial production, and right. that doesn't mean that there can't be you know there can't be an offer. You know that's being made, but we have to come to terms on a, on a, on something on a friendly basis, right? Um, but once the standstill is over, then you know, then it's really a Newmont's court. I mean, uh, they'll decide, you know, obviously what what they want to do, and I don't know what they're going to 
they're going to do. But, you know, given their market cap and our market cap, I mean, obviously they have choices. They have the upper, they have up the upper hand. Absolutely. Right. You know, but when it comes back to your other question about, you know, you know, money's a funny thing and, and, you know, you know, what happens if some, you know, doing things that, that are possibly in Newmont's interest and not in Continental's interest. Look, if they have a 20% stake in the company, they are a significant shareholder and we value their opinion, but they don't control Continental Gold. And there are issues, you know, where if, if and, and quite frankly, if we had Newmont's pocketbook, possibly we would do some certain things as well, but we're not Newmont, we're Continental Gold. And we decided that, okay, that's a technical valid point. However, you know, we're going to choose to address that, you know, once we reach commercial production and we have some cash flows, right? So Newmont certainly would do certain little things differently, um, but nothing material right. that has come up and basically said, oh my God, you're doing it completely, you know, the wrong way, right? And there's been a meeting of the minds through the technical, you know, the technical teams on, on various issues where they've come to us and said, look it. You know, a case in point is, you know, our original resource estimate, which was the 2015 mineral resource estimate, had 89 distinct veins. Okay. And, you know, Newmont came to us and says, well, we don't think you should mine 89 veins. It's going to be too difficult, too difficult to plan. You know, we think you should look at it more as kind of vein domains. And through various discussions and, 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 um, and you know, in collaboration, you know, we've agreed that you know our updated mineral resource estimate that we published in 2019 we're not going to mine 89 veins we're going to we're going to now we've, it's now shifted to I don't, don't quote me on the number but i think something like 29 vein domains okay right. that was uh i don't want to say a newmont led issue but certainly they were pushing forward and our technical team uh came to the realization that that's a better way to go great i have the same conversations with my brother <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm always right. <laughs> um, so let's let's go into some a, a bit more about money, okay? Because while we're on the topic, so it, it gets me to where I want to be in terms of what I want to ask you. So, what's your enterprise value today, or market cap, whatever you want to? Market cap's roughly four hundred million. Four hundred million bucks. Okay. So, and how much has been spent to date on the project? Yeah. So, or, well, we, all, all, all in, an all-in number, you know, whatever. Okay. So, look, we've raised five hundred eighty-five million dollars to date, mm -hmm. okay? And the project capital, the capital project budget is $512 million. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The $512 million doesn't include working capital, exploration costs, yeah. corporate overheads, right? Right. So it gives you kind of an idea. And we're yeah. roughly two thirds of the way done the project. And so are you sitting on any cash? How much cash are you sitting on? Uh, I think at the end of March, we're sitting on $92 million of cash. Okay. And but the triple flag, the triple flag, the hundred million hadn't fund wasn't funded yet. Yeah. In yeah. fact, that'll be funded next week. Okay. Pretty. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. 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 So, so, so this... there's a process of perfecting security and so and whatnot in Colombia, and so that's been completed now. So they're going to fund next week. How? How? Okay. Segue. How do you perfect security in Colombia? How does that work? It's actually fairly straightforward. I mean, it's right. it's it's cumbersome. Okay. Uh, you know when you. If you look at our, our assets, right, I mean, the, obviously the mining asset, the, the mineralization of the ground is the main asset, but there's also land that like surface rights that we control. And we rough, we, we own roughly 100 pieces of right. land, right? So, what, you know, that's in and around the project and actually registering security on those pieces of land is just a cumbersome process, yeah. right? So you got to you got to put a package together and then you have to act physically deliver it to a, a government agency. They have to go through it, make sure there's no typos and this, you know, it's a typical kind of Latin American process. Um, mm. We went through it in 2016 with, with Red Kite uh, and we had to redo it again with for Triple Flag. So uh, we got it done. We got it done quicker this time. Right, right. Okay. And so I haven't looked at the corporate structure. I'm assuming you've got stuff sitting outside the country, which is holding a lot of this or is everything in country? No, we have we, we have a Canadian parent company with Bermuda Holding Companies Bermuda, that okay. own Colombian assets. Okay. But the vast majority of the assets are in Colombia. Right, 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 right. Other than other than the cash. Of course, of course. Um. So, so if I so if I look at that, obviously, yeah, you you can paint a picture with those numbers. It's it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Um, what do you think the 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 
the, what do you think that the um, getting into production is going to do do for you next year? Because if I look at some of the events which have happened up until now, like you had some result drill results drill results out in May, didn't do a thing. There were good there were good results. You had some results at the beginning of June, which did have a pop, but it also coincided with the dollar going up. So there's a bunch of stuff the company is doing and has, which doesn't seem to get reflected in the share price. And then the dollar moves and everything, everything, everything starts, will start. We don't know if it's going to sustain. It starts moving the right direction. Has it been a frustrating process for yeah. you building something like you've got and not being able to predict what effect it's going to have? Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, you've seen the, 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 the famous uh, graph, which is yeah. the natural like, yeah. cycle of, yeah. of a mining company, right? Where you make an expiration. Yeah. I liked you, yours. It was lovely. Start an expiration and it starts peaking. And then yeah. the minute you start permitting, financing and constructing, everybody lose interest. Valuation decreases. And then as you come closer to commercial production, it re-rates, right? right. Uh, we did everything in our power. Yeah. To, to buck that trend and we were unsuccessful. I mean, we, we, we had a big exploration program going in 2018. We had great results, but the reality is uh, you just can't, uh, you can't buck that trend. Now on the positive side is that history tells you that there's a great opportunity right in front of us because you know, every, you know, every company that has brought on a mine into production, right that hasn't had technical issues mm. right there is a re, there's a there's a re-rate that happens between within the last 12 months yeah. and we're sitting exactly at that point right now and uh i'm confident that as we get closer to commercial production our valuation will change from 0.5 nav kind of where it's trading today closer to 0 0.7 0 0.8 nav along right along more in line with our peers or single asset producers in latin america yeah, I mean, I'd like to talk about that because you, you do align yourself in terms of the peers to specific companies and you're trying to draw parallels there. And I, and I, I get the, the need to want to do that. But just on, on this, so if, do, if the dollar does get back below 1300 bucks, okay, we, we had a massive rush the last couple of weeks, which is great. Great news for you, great news for you, and a lot of uh, gold um, developers as well. What do you think that's going to do for you? I mean, are you nervous about the dollar dropping again? Or do you think the fact that you're up near nearly producing and you say, well, that's the catalyst moment. It doesn't really matter for 1300 bucks. Our ASIC is 600 odd bucks. Yeah. We're all good. How do you feel? Yeah, okay. we, we all love it, obviously, when the gold price sure. you know, increases. But, you know, this asset uh, can withstand a much lower gold price than most assets, Yeah. right? Um, so, you know, obviously we're cheering for, for a higher gold price. We think that it should be a higher gold price, but we don't control that. Uh, we control our all in sustaining costs and, you know, we're comfortable that, you know, we'll, we'll be comfortably in the lowest quartile of cash cost producers. Just, I mean, there's various factors, but primarily because of great. So, so given all of that, I mean, you know, it's a nuanced interest that the price doesn't go up too much because if they do, do want to step in, obviously it costs them a bit more money. I know they've got oodles and oodles of cash. It's, it's probably inconsequential to them. But at the same time, they don't want this thing to go to five bucks before we step in. I mean, have, with this uh, standstill they've got, are, do you think there's a level at which they're going to step in and say, right, okay, we're, we're, we're going to come in a bit early here. Um, we're going to take over. I, I honestly don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't know. We, we think about this all the time. Um, Newman obviously, uh, you know, has a lot on their plate right now from, a, you know, their Gold Corp merger. Um, you know, they just fend the, you know, dealt with the Barrick bid. Um, but having said all of that, you know, uh, I know that they do like Columbia. They like Columbia at the macro level from the, for its prospectivity. Um, Newmont was in, you know, went into Peru in the early days, you know, when security situation was similar to where what it is in Toronto or in Colombia today. Um, so they're not, you know, they're not inexperienced with these kinds of things. And, you know, where else are you going to get, you know, 300,000 or up to 300,000 ounces of, of, of gold a year at, at, you know, at the cash costs 
that we're going to produce. So we know we have a compelling asset, but honestly, I don't know and we don't know what they'll do and, and only time will tell. Yeah, okay. Uh, you have shares? I do, of course. You sold any? No, not once, not, not ever. And right. I've been with the company, this is my ninth year. Oh, right, wow, okay. And do they, is, is the management team held in any way or are they, or are they free trading? Like the rest of the board or management team? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they are free trading, but generally speaking, the, you know, management directors haven't haven't sold uh, any shares over the last number of years. The only time I can remember anybody selling shares is when they've exercised options and they've sold a they sold a portion of it to cover the tax bill. Other right. than that, generally speaking, uh, it's you know, there's been a just a net net buying of shares over the last couple of years. Right. Okay. Interesting. interesting. Thanks for that. Um, okay. So, can we just? I just want to cover a few little things, which I make sure I've got. So, the the company's got all the licenses and permits it needs to get through to First Poor. That's all done. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. I, I I only ask because there are people in chat rooms who are, you know trying to um, tell tell us different. Um, can if we look at last? I know you said last year was 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 tricky for reasonably discussed at the beginning, but you, you also ran over on the budget. What happened? Well, you're talking about the project budget? For sure. Yeah, so actually, I mean, the original project budget was 389 million out of the feasibility study, and it is currently now $512 million. The vast majority of that increase mm. uh, wasn't a cost escalation issues. It was, there was a, a major scope change related to the water treatment plant. So Columbia, uh, in the midst of us putting, publishing our feasibility study, had discharge regulations of X. And then they came out with new discharge regulations, uh, like water discharge regulations that were extremely stringent, like beyond even first world country limits. And uh, when we started constructing the mine, we looked at these limits and looked at the technology that we had chosen in the feasibility study, and that wasn't going to cut it. So we needed to upgrade. We obviously water is not a, something you could take any risk with. Um, that that's basically a showstopper if you get that wrong. Um, so we had to upgrade our, our our water treatment plant, and believe it or not, that was roughly fifty million dollars. Okay, when you add it all in, which was you know it needed a larger footprint, so you had to actually you know do some earthworks or in, in, and some engineering to make it fit, and then we had to uh, you know. Uh, the government asked us to discharge it directly into the Calca River, which is about two or three kilometers down, mm -hmm. down in the valleys and not put it directly into a stream. Um, so when you add it all in, it was roughly $50 million. Then we took uh, two major items. One was the electrical power line mm -hmm. and the other one was the, uh, the, the, the tram system, which is this, uh, a system that's going to take the tailings and put it into a paste plant up at the top of the mountain. Those two items, uh, total give or take 25 to $30 million, were actually in sustaining capital in the feasibility study. And when we started thinking about operating the mine without the tram system for the first couple of years, because mm -hmm. the feasibility study contemplated trucking the tailings up the mountain, that was a little bit too risky for us to, 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 like, uh, to, to stomach when we actually sat there and thought about it. Um, so we decided that we were gonna put that up into upfront capital and on the power line, um, the feasibility study contemplated kind of a rent to own kind of concept where the utility would actually construct it, own it, and we would pay a rental fee. But when we looked at the cost of capital, what it was gonna cost to do that versus our cost of capital, it was cheaper for us just to buy it. So those two items, like I said, 25 to 30 million plus the water treatment plant, there's 80 million of the increase that was just scope changes and things in from sustaining. The rest of the stuff, there's some minor items and some minor cost escalation stuff, and that's how the capital, that's how the capital cost went from 389 to 512. Right. So, was, what was the balance in? What was the balance of over on that? Uh, just I, nothing major. Uh, there was uh, it was you know there were some cost increases. I mean, we we did the feasibility study. We published it in 2016, I believe, and and you know we used 2015 prices, and as you go from 15 to 2018 prices obviously there's you know even though inflation is reasonable in Colombia there's still a three or four percent annual inflation rate and so we had to kind of adjust things for, for those kinds of factors but does that does that account for the, the balance or were there any other larger ticket items 
That, yeah, no other large ticket items. Right, okay, okay. So and would you say in terms of G&A, you're pretty well run, pretty tight ship, or do you think because you've, you've had all of this money in, it's been, well, a little bit more casual? How, how do you say, how do you yeah, I, mark I think yourself? Our GNA is, I think our G&A is in, is in good shape. Right. Um, you know, just like every other business owner, I mean, we're always looking on, you know, different ways of how we can do things better, cheaper, et cetera. But generally, I think we're okay. Mm. You know, we've had a bit of a unique situation in at Veritica because we've, we've operated a little 30 ton per day mine there for the last 20, 25 years. Mm. So it comes, even though it's not exciting from an economics perspective or cash flow perspective, you know, you still need to have, you know, finance, finance, you still need to have IT, you still need to have, you know, health and safety. And so all of these kind of areas of the business we've had for a very long time. So we didn't have kind of the typical ramp up experience uh, that most junior companies that are developing a mine would have because we've been kind of managing that for, for obviously a long time. I mean, so how long, how long, you've been there nine years, right? Yeah. So has this been nine years in the making or longer? Absolutely. Yeah, I joined, I joined a Continental Gold, uh, a mutual friend of Ari and mine uh, introduced us. Uh, I was, I was looking for an opportunity in the mining space and uh, met Ari and we hit it off, but Continental didn't even have a mineral resource at that point. It was just a right. couple of drill holes. Um, and uh, Ari looked at me and told me that, you know, you should, you should come on board because this is going to be big. And, uh, and I believed them and, and thankfully I did. There you go, an overnight success yeah. <laughs> in nine years. It's, it's, if people forget how long it takes to kind of make things work, right? Yeah. So you're, you're at that point where you're nearly pouring gold and I think that's where it's gonna get exciting for you. Um, so if I look between now and then, you've got a few months to go. You're, you're talking about mid year or first yeah. half, right? So First gold core H1 2020. Yeah. Okay. So, but towards the latter end of that. Um, no, we haven't guided it. We haven't guided anything more you know, uh, precise than H1 2020. Right. Right. Okay. Commercial production six months thereafter. You know, as we get closer to mechanical completion, we will we'll tighten that up. But as of now, it's H1 2020. Right. Okay. And and you you've got enough cash to take you through to then. There's no there's no more raises or structure finance well, to come apart from well, obviously the the capex yeah so i mean the capex is we're pretty comfortable with the capex because right. the detailed engineering is is 100 percent complete um you know from a from a cash point of view we'll have to wait and see it, there's a couple of variables there i mean obviously there's it's it, and the, the biggest one is when can we get the mechanical completion right right okay. and sooner we can get the mechanical completion then you know, obviously, the uh, the better odds are that uh, we won't need a significant. I won't say significant. We won't need a cash infusion, we'll, regardless of whichever way it, it, it plays out. Uh, it'll be a fraction of what we've raised to date. Right. If okay. But it'd be it'd be anti dilutory at this point. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, we're all shareholders of the company. Um, and dilution is obviously a big concern of ours. And obviously you could tell by the financing we announced in March of 2019, I think we did a good job of minimizing that. Mm. Uh, so we have that in the back of our mind all the time, but I don't know at this point how, which shape or form it'll be. Okay, so, so what, what are the, uh, I can't, can't quite remember who said it, but uh, what are the known unknowns between now and then? It's really, it, it really boils down to, can we get the productivity out of our contractors right. that we expect? That's what it boils down to. And we're watching that on a weekly basis. Right. Um, you know, and uh, it, you, I, you I employ, employ a lot of locals. So are they all local contractors? Yeah, we have we have roughly 2,500 contractors at, at site right now working. Right. And we have a thousand employees, give or take. So there's a lot of people there. It's a it's a big project. Um, and, uh, you know, you, I don't care if you're building a mine in Colombia or you're building it up in northern Ontario or Northwest Territories, you need to manage the contractors. And, and to do that, you need to be on them and monitor, you know, from a schedule point of view, you know, where, how they're tracking. And, uh, and this is no different. And so this, we're, we're looking at this quite closely. And, um, you know, so far, so good. 
So for people new to this, not just existing inv investors, um, should they be looking at what the company is doing or should they be just tracking the, the, uh, the dollar and seeing what that's well, doing to affect gold? I think they should be looking at what the company's doing because, I mean, there's, I mean, if the gold price goes up by a hundred or two hundred dollars an ounce, um, you know, they can make, they'll be able to make money on, you know, in lots of gold mining companies because all the all the share prices are going to go up. Sure. What are the opportunity here is in Continental is that you know our current valuation is extremely compelling. We're at that curve as we talked about earlier, right? And we are on the cusp of reaching commercial production where we expect and history has shown that valuations improve. Uh, and, and so there's a big opportunity for us as long as we can bring this mine on time and on budget and, and don't have any technical issues. Um, and we're confident about that. So I think they should be watching on what we're doing because I think there's more torque in a continental gold share than you know the vast majority of the other gold mining shares just by virtue of where we are in, in, in that curve. Okay, Look, I appreciate your time today, Paul. That was uh, a good run through. It's a nice first introduction to certainly all our um, subscribers and investors. Um, wouldn't mind catching up with you, you know, in a few months' time when a few more of these deliverables have happened. It'd be interesting to sort of see what the share price does between now and then. Obviously, you've got a nice little bump this uh, this this June, so long may that continue. And uh, thank you for your time. Okay, great. You're welcome, and thank you. We'd. Uh love to come back in a couple of months and give you an update on how we're, how we're progressing. Thank you very much for watching our video. We do aim to give you informed and intelligent information with which to make your investment decisions. So if you liked what you just saw, please give us a thumbs up. And if you want to see more insightful, in-depth, honest and unbiased interviews, then please click the subscribe button. So thanks again for watching and we look forward to seeing you again soon.